Hello, it's Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and in today's installment on rapid response calls in the hospital, I'm discussing acute agitation. Imagine you're the intern on call, and you're putting the finishing touches on the sign-out sheet five minutes from the end of your shift, when suddenly this text page comes through. Lee, nurse on unit J6, calling regarding patient Thomas. Patient is agitated and not redirectable, unable to get vitals, staff nervous regarding safety, bedside evaluation requested as soon as possible. I think this might be my most dreaded page for a couple of reasons. One, acute agitation is often blown off as sundowning or just delirium when they can immediately precede a medical catastrophe, albeit uncommonly. Second, it's one of the few situations in which you need to worry about more than the patient. You also need to worry about staff safety and your own personal safety too. Yet, we're doctors or APPs. If the patient becomes physically violent, we aren't trained in self-defense. And to that point, medical training, excluding psychiatry and possibly emergency medicine, doesn't usually include any specific curricular instruction, simulation, or role play on how to handle a potentially violent patient. What's contained in this short video on how to handle this situation is more than was included in all of the training I received across four years of medical school and three years of internal medicine residency. So yeah, I'm not a fan of this category of text page. As you hurry to the patient's ward, what are some things you should be considering? The first is that there is a spectrum to acute agitation in which an episode can be mapped to more than one overlapping clinical situation. For example, the agitation could be due to an acute medical illness like alcohol withdrawal or encephalitis leading to delirium. It could be due to poor control of a chronic psychiatric condition like schizophrenia or mania. It could be due to a personality disorder which are less dramatic mental health conditions that involve persistent and disruptive patterns of thinking, behavior, and inability to relate to others. Or last, it could be a stress response to acute illness in a person who is otherwise normally functioning. The further to the left the situation, the more a thorough, timely medical evaluation of the agitation is essential, while de-escalation and attempts to reason with the patient are usually unsuccessful. Conversely, with an uncomplicated psychological stress response, a thorough medical evaluation of the agitation is usually unnecessary, and patients usually can be reasoned with, provided you use a good approach. So a very general goal in evaluating the agitated patient is to determine where on the spectrum or in which category they likely fall to know where your efforts should be directed, acknowledging that the patient may fall into more than one category. From a diagnostic framework standpoint, the etiologies of acute agitation could be placed into one of three general categories. First is the toxin and medication category. The common culprits among medication are steroids and anticholinergics. Drug withdrawal, of which alcohol and benzodiazepines are the most common. Stimulant intoxication, such as methamphetamines. And the superficially similar conditions of serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome, both of which are triggered by medications. Then there is a broad category for other medical conditions that includes encephalitis and meningitis, hyperactive delirium, which itself is more of a syndrome caused by sepsis, electrolyte shifts, or just being in the hospital. There's a phenomenon called sundowning, which was mentioned a minute ago, in which a patient with dementia routinely becomes agitated in the early evening, particularly when in unfamiliar environments. Although sundowning very much looks like delirium, I personally consider it a separate entity because it's chronic, and if the patient is unchanged from baseline, it does not necessarily need to be further worked up, unlike delirium. There is a post-ictal state in which patients can be acutely confused in the minutes following a generalized seizure, and hypoglycemia. The last category is predictably non-medical conditions, such as the aforementioned acute stress response, personality disorders, schizophrenia, and mania. In my anecdotal experience as an adult hospitalist in the United States, the most common reasons that already hospitalized patients become acutely agitated 
are alcohol withdrawal, hyperactive delirium, sundowning, and an acute stress response, but this will be dependent upon one's patient population. So now you've arrived at your patient's ward, and you find them anxiously pacing in the hallway, yelling at the nurses who are doing the, their absolute best to verbally calm the patient down. What do you do? First, an attempt to take a conventional medical history or perform a physical exam on an acutely agitated patient is usually counterproductive. Instead, your primary goals should be patient, staff, and personal safety, and to calm the patient enough to perform a medical evaluation, which may not be possible without the use of either physical restraints and or sedation. So how do we calm the patient down? What are some strategies we can attempt? At the start, try to minimize the staff who are physically with the patient to the fewest safe number. So you don't want eight people to be surrounding the patient in the hallway unless the patient is so aggressive that physical restraints are immediately warranted. At the same time though, do not engage an agitated patient alone in an enclosed location such as their hospital room. Try calm but firm verbal de-escalation. If the patient is disoriented, briefly explain that they're in the hospital and why. Reassure that you are there to help. Attempt to establish the patient's understanding of why they are upset. And particularly when the patient seems to be on the right side of the spectrum that I showed a minute ago, meaning personality disorder or acute stress response, in which they will be more amenable to reason, considering offering a small gesture to help calm them. This could be food, a drink, a fresh gown, or a warm blanket. By quickly running through this list, I don't mean to imply these strategies are easy to employ or that they will always work. How to do this successfully could comprise an entire afternoon workshop. Use hospital security as a backup if the above measures are unsuccessful or if the patient and staff or yourself are in imminent danger. If you do call security, please consider the patient's possible responses to that. Having four uniformed security guards show up to an agitated older white patient might generate a very different response than if they were to show up to an agitated younger black patient due to different prior experiences and perception of law enforcement. At some point, whether through verbal de-escalation or pharmacologic sedation, you will eventually be able to perform a medical evaluation on the patient. What diagnoses might be suggested by your findings? On history, if there was a recent new medication, an increase in the dose of a pre-existing medication, or acute kidney injury that could impair the clearance of a medication, consider a medication side effect, including serotonin syndrome and NMS. If the patient has a history of alcohol or drug abuse, obviously consider those causes. Dementia can be associated with sundowning, but it's also a risk factor for de novo delirium, as is any infection. On exam, if the patient is angry but well-oriented and displaying a linear thought process, that suggests either an acute stress response or personality disorder as the main driver of agitation. If the patient has some combination of hypotension, tachycardia, and fever, that suggests sepsis-related delirium. On the other hand, if they have some combination of hypertension, tachycardia, fever, and plus or minus dilated pupils, that suggests the delirium tremens of alcohol withdrawal, stimulant intoxication, anticholinergic toxicity, serotonin syndrome, or NMS. Myoclonus and increased reflexes are consistent with serotonin syndrome, while rigidity and decreased reflexes are consistent with NMS. And last, new onset urinary and or fecal incontinence strongly suggests a post-ictal state. When evaluating the patient for these findings, consider your personal safety. Always maintain easy access to the door for all parties. That way the patient doesn't feel trapped or boxed in, and you always have a means of escape if the patient becomes violent. I said this already, but do not examine the patient alone. As suggested previously, you don't necessarily want 10 people in the room, but you do want at least one other person. Maintain two arms lengths from the patient, except when absolutely necessary. Avoid leaning directly over the patient during the exam, unless the patient is fully restrained. 
And don't wear your stethoscope around your neck, since it could be used in an attempt to strangle you, which has happened. Now let's talk diagnostics. That is, for patients in whom you decide an emergent medical workup is indicated, what tests should be included in that process? First, a finger stick glucose, if the patient might have received a hypoglycemic medication, most notably insulin. Everyone should have their medication list reviewed. Consider a urine tox screen if in-hospital drug abuse is a possibility, though this may be impractical to obtain at first. If sepsis-induced delirium is a possibility, a full set of labs is indicated. And regarding neuroimaging, for acute agitation that develops once someone has already been admitted to the hospital, it is only rarely indicated. I personally can't think of a single case that I've seen in which this was necessary in the absence of seizures, an established history of an intracranial tumor, or recent neurosurgery. Next is treatment. Obviously, you should always treat the underlying cause, but there are two categories of general treatments that may be necessary for patients with acute agitation, irrespective of etiology. The first is physical restraints. These are reserved for situations in which there is an imminent risk of harm to the patient or others, including yourself, or there is a dangerous disruption to ongoing treatment, such as a disoriented and violent patient with an infection pulling out the IV that was giving them antibiotics. Restraints should never be used for punishment or staff convenience. Over the years, I have seen the occasional use of a physical restraint for a patient when a sitter would have been sufficient because there wasn't a sitter available. And just that is just not okay. If a sitter would be sufficient for patient and staff safety, it is the hospital administration's responsibility to ensure that one is provided. When it comes to actually applying restraints, institutions usually have strict and specific protocols on the process. Physicians themselves are rarely part of the team that does the physical restraining. That's partly to prevent the complete annihilation of a doctor-patient relationship, but it's more so because you really need to be trained in the safe application of restraints, and that training is just not a part of residency. Once restrained, patients need to be frequently monitored. Although rare, death due to restraints does happen, typically due to strangulation or positional asphyxia, from restraints that were either improperly applied or which were somehow improvised. And restraints should be removed as soon as possible, typically once the patient has been sedated. Now let's move to sedation. In the literature, this is usually called chemical sedation or chemical restraint, both of which sound a little off to me, so I'm going to call this pharmacologic sedation, in which we are giving a patient a medication for the primary purpose of sedating them. Before specific meds, there are some general principles. One must consider the degree of desired sedation, possible routes of administration, and patient-specific side effect profile. For example, if a patient has pre-existing QT prolongation, or if they have severe COPD or obesity hypoventilation syndrome and are already prone to hypercapnia, either of these might impact the choice of drug or the dose. Speaking of which, err on the lower side of dosing for older patients and for those with chronic illness. You can always give more, but you can't take back what's already been given. The first choice in agitation related to drug intoxication or withdrawal is typically a benzodiazepine. The first choice in a primary psychiatric illness is an antipsychotic. And the first choice in a violent patient of unknown etiology is usually a combination of both. Regarding specific drugs, Common choices which can all be given either IV or IM include the benzodiazepines lorazepam or midazolam, of which midazolam is believed to have the faster onset. Common antipsychotics for agitation include haloperidol or droperidol, of which droperidol is believed to work faster. Although it's not commonly used on the general medicine or surgical wards, ketamine is sometimes used for agitation in the ER. I'll end the video with some common pitfalls of dealing with acute agitation. Not calling security early enough when indicated, suggesting an inadequate consideration of staff safety, or calling security when they are not needed, which might unnecessarily agitate the patient further. 
reflexively using physical restraints or pharmacological sedation before reasonable attempts at verbal de-escalation. And last, an insufficient consideration of a possible medication side effect as the underlying etiology.